Before Lloyd Trigg left his home in Pahiatua in 1941, he promised his wife, I'm not going to go looking for decorations. By then he was 27, married with two sons. That's actually them in the photo on your screen. Trigg joined WW2 relatively late in the piece, and I mean joined as in volunteering as opposed to being conscripted. There was a major kickback from the New Zealand population at the start of the war that family men be exempted service. Trigg's father was English and he had installed a hatred of Germans into his son born out of the First World War. Because he had a fascination with the aeronautical, Trigg ticked the box to join the New Zealand Air Force, trained successfully towards becoming a pilot first in New Zealand then in Canada before joining the RAF Coastal Command in late 1942. 200 Squadron's main job was reconnaissance and sub-hunting. Using the two-engined American Lockheed Hudsons. In peacetime, they were called and known as the Super Electra. Crewed by five, these light bombers also became the backbone of both the New Zealand and Australian Air Forces in the Pacific. The range of the Hudson was impressive even by modern standards. 3,200 kilometres. I worked that out to be a Scotland to New York. In early 1943, Coastal Command got their mitts on the larger Lockheed Liberators. Both Hudson's and Liberators played a major role winning the conflict in Europe. World War II was a battle between the industrial capabilities of the combatants and their supply chains as much as army versus army. The US's industrial might wasn't any good if their munitions were on the bottom of the Atlantic. Aided with bases in Canada, Scotland and Iceland etc, and these two bombers closed the gap in the middle of the Atlantic where previously U-boats had free reign. Modern day submarine movies also tend to skew a view of submarine warfare. During World War II, submarines spent most of their time on the surface. Underwater, they could at best travel only 100 kilometres. Thus, they were highly vulnerable to attack. Now back to Mr Trigg who was transferred to West Africa in January of 1943. There he won a Distinguished Flying Cross in March of that year, piloting a Hudson in a depth charging run against a U-boat. After 45 missions in the Hudson, he was one of the two pilots chosen to train and fly the new Liberators, travelling to the Bahamas and flying one back to his base in Banjul. Don't worry, my African geography is as bad as yours. Banjul is the capital of Gambia. None the wiser? Look here. The British had occupied several other Gambian airports like this Hudson at Yundom. That's spelt Y-U-N-D-O-M. And that place name will come up again shortly. The Liberator he commanded was donned D for dog and had a crew of eight. It's now time to take a look at them as well. There were four Kiwis, two Brits and a Canadian. Let's first start with the four other Kiwis, for which we need to thank the Auckland Cenotaph for preserving their identities for posterity. Flying Officer Marinovich from Auckland. Flight Sergeant Bennett from Wellington. Flight Sergeant Frost from Auckland. And from Tarkaka, a Flight Sergeant Soper. They were joined by Pilot Officer George Goodwin from the Canadian Royal Air Force. The debonair Goodwin was just 20 at the time and he grew up in the small farming town of Ericsson, Manitoba. That is just down the road from the Brandon Manitoba Airport where the Commonwealth aircrew trained, including all the aforementioned Kiwis. Try as I might, I couldn't find a photo of the British contingent. 
I'm sure would all like to see one. So if you're a relative or better than me at rustling up one on Google, place the link in the comment section please. We are after Flying Officer John Eric James Townsend, who lived in Belfast and was 33 at the time, and 27-year-old Pilot Officer Richard Bonnock from Middlesex. Now to the fateful day, August the 11th, 1943, when D for Dog was flying out of Yundom. Three hours into the patrol off the coast of Senegal, they spotted a U-boat. U-468 was on the surface. You'll see it's not a particularly large vessel, 67 metres long. The crew of the sub knew it was too late to submerge and they manned their 20mm anti-aircraft guns as Defa Dog came straight at them on what needed to be a low level run at reduced speed in order to be accurate. The German ACAC struck the aircraft along one of the wings and also the tail. Tracer could also be seen passing through the fuselage which was soon on fire along with one of the port engines. And the captain of the U-boat, Oberleutnant Clemens Charamon, felt sure his attacker would be forced to ditch in the ocean given the terminal beating it had received. Trigg and his crew, however, they had other ideas. They turned the doomed aircraft around and began another run, all whilst fire was being poured into the plane. 50 metres from the sub, the plane dropped six jet charges, two of which exploded in or on the vessel before crashing into the sea and breaking up on impact. Everyone in D for Dog was killed. U-462 was mortally wounded and sank within 10 minutes. About the half the crew of 42 surviving the initial sinking. Miraculously, a Charlemagne and six other submariners located a life raft jettisoned from the Liberator. That's actually the raft in question. The seven were picked up the next day by the HMS Clarkia after the aircraft was reported missing and a raft was spotted by a Sunderland flying boat looking for survivors. Naturally there were high hopes it contained D for Dog's crew. The rest of the U-boat crew were either drowned or were eaten by sharks. Nitched net, not nice. The surviving crew were interrogated. To their captor's surprise, Charlemagne and First Lieutenant Lemansberg recommended that the crew of the Liberator be given the highest award that the British Empire could possibly offer. Via their testimony alone, on the 2nd of November 1943, Trigg was awarded the Victoria Cross for his bravery. The only Victoria Cross to ever be issued solely on the reports of the enemy in both world wars. Trigg's award was also the first ever for anyone engaged in anti-submarine warfare. The medal itself was presented to Trigg's wife Nola in a low-key event in their house. She wanted it held there so his mates and family could attend. That was the shot that was taken at the beginning of the video. These are his two lads to place some poignancy on the situation. At some stage, the medal was sold to a collector and surfaced at an auction in 1998. There it fetched a then record price of pound sterling, 120,000. That worked out to be 165,000 in US dollars at the time to make the sum more understandable. Purchased by the Lord Ashford Collection, that medal is now in the Imperial War Museum in London. Triggs VC was the last one a New Zealander would win under the auspice of Britain. Since 1999, New Zealand has had its own Victoria Cross. In an interesting twist to end this on, the U-boat captain, Clement Charlemagne, was living close to where his U-boat was built in northern Germany in the year 2008, then aged 90. On the same broad theme, perhaps I could also tempt you to watch The Sun as well. Coming in at less than 10 minutes, it's the story of New Zealand's first fighter ace, Thomas Culling in WW1. There's a link in the description. 
It is impossible not to feel humbled and in awe of men like Lloyd Trigg and his crew. And I mean men in the truest sense of the term. We owe a great debt to the sacrifice they made. Let their names and their stories never be forgotten. I hope to see you next time. Bye for now.